Well, good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning here at Elk Lake Baptist as we worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And a special welcome to those worshiping online with us as well. I have a few announcements. Um, first off, as you can probably smell, this morning immediately after uh, the service, we have our annual chili potluck. Uh, everyone is welcome and I took a look, there's lots of food. So whether you brought something or not, please stay with us and, and join us for good food and good fellowship today. I wanted to let you know of a volunteer opportunity. If you're a trained or experienced bookkeeper or accountant, and if you want to be a missionary without ever leaving home, uh, an organization called IT Global, which is an organization that I volunteer with, has an opportunity as a volunteer bookkeeper to support its worldwide teaching ministry. If, uh, if you're interested, uh, come chat with me. And speaking of missions, you are invited to the Victoria Heart for Asia 2024 Missions Conference, uh, which is focused on reaching the peoples of East Asia and Canada with the hope of Jesus Christ. It's going to be held next Saturday, October 27th, at Emmanuel Baptist Church, and there are details in your bulletin. Wanted to let you know to save the date, our next quarterly general meeting will be held Thursday, November 7th at 7 p.m. here at the church, and this is going to be an important meeting for all members. And a couple of our regular activities, uh, this coming Wednesday, October 23rd at 7 p.m. here at the church is our prayer meeting. And uh, Pastor Grant's course, uh, What Do Christians Believe, has started, but if you haven't, if you didn't, if you weren't there Saturday, all you missed was the introduction, so we'll get into the meat of it this coming Saturday, 10 a.m. at Emmanuel Center. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we bow down and worship before you because you are our God. And we are so thankful that you have made us your people. We thank you that you have brought us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life, into the kingdom of light, and we walk with you in light every day. We welcome you here today, Father. Touch us with your spirit and change our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 348, My Savior's Love. So that's just a blue book in front of you, number 348. Um, Please stand with me as we sing. Yes. 
Please bow with me in prayer. <clears throat> Most merciful God, we confess to you now that we have sinned. We confess the sins that no one knows and the sins that everyone knows. We confess the sins that are a burden to us and the sins that do not bother us because we've become used to them. We confess our sins as a church that we have not loved one another as Christ has loved us, and that we have not given ourselves in love and service for the world as Christ gave himself for us. Father, forgive us. Send your Holy Spirit to us to give us power to live as by your mercy you have called us to live. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. God, the Father of all mercy, has reconciled the world to himself through the death and resurrection of his Son, Jesus Christ. He has not counted against us our trespasses, but has sent us his Holy Spirit to shed abroad his love and light into our hearts. May you now receive his pardon and peace to stand before him in his strength alone, by his grace alone. May the peace of the Lord be with you. I'd like to invite the worship team to come forward. So it's time for uh, Adventure Time for our kids. Um, but before they go, I'm just going to say a quick word of prayer for them, and then we'll let them out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many ways that you bless us. We thank you especially right now for the blessing of our children. And we pray that as they go um, to have their own time of learning and worship, that you would open their minds to understand your word, and that you would soften their hearts to believe, that they might find the joy that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kids, you're free to head on out. And we are now going to enter into um, the prayers of our community, which is our opportunity uh, to bring before God as a body of believers uh, three things. First of all, our thanksgivings for what we recognize God has done uh, in our lives or in the world. Uh, second, any requests for his help or intercession. And finally, any word of encouragement you may have uh, that would be helpful to share to your brothers and sisters in Christ, something that God may have done or something that uh, you may remember from a scripture that you read through the week. Um, so if you remember any of those things, a thanksgiving, a request, or a uh, word of encouragement, we ask that you just raise your hand from where you're seated and share it in a clear voice, and then I will wrap it all up together in a prayer at the end. All right, let's pray. Would you please bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us, that you, in spite of our rebellion and our sin and the many ways we've run away from you, that you have pursued us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, and that at this time there is nothing that we can do that is more delightful and pleasing to you than just share with you our heart's concerns and our prayers and our thanksgivings. And so we thank you, God of the universe, for your loving attention to us as we pray.
Lord, we want to lift up our hands to you. For Lord, we recognize that you are at work in all things, that you are sovereign, and that you, there's not even a, a, a bird or a leaf that falls to the ground and you do not notice. And so, Lord, we pray that we would be able to trust you in all this, that we would be obedient in the little things you ask us and trust that it is you that is coordinating all these things for the good of us and for the glory of your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'd like to invite Ben to come and read scripture for us. I'd like to first say thank you to the music team and to everyone who's participated in the service. It's really been um, very uh, encouraging to me. And it's amazing how uh, when we come together to worship Jesus, uh, God does often, very often does something special in our hearts. And uh, I'm thankful for the gift of music and how he touches our emotions um, and connects them with his truth. So thank you. The scripture reading today is uh, from the book of Jonah, chapters 1 and 2, the full Chapters 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord, because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O oh Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the sea, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. 
This is the word of the Lord. Would you please bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the source of our joy and our peace, and that through the words that we find in Scripture, you speak to us by your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we invite you now to speak to us again, that as we consider this first half of the story about Jonah, that you would open our minds to understand and especially open our hearts, that we would respond to the calling that this story calls out to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who loves us. Amen. It has been said somewhere, or somewhere, I don't really remember exactly where, that a good short story is something you can read in an hour and remember for a lifetime. It's not a good phrase. It's it's something you can read in an hour and remember for a lifetime. And the book of Jonah is one of those kinds of stories, isn't it? It's one of these stories that, uh, you know, is well known beyond uh, the Bible itself as favorite not only of Christians, but a favorite story throughout uh, much of the world's history. And the story uh, divides into two halves, quite neatly, actually. Um, The first part, or half, uh, is in chapters 1 and 2, which was read to us this morning. And it tells uh, the story of God's surprising grace in response to Jonah's stubborn rebellion, right? That's what it's about. Uh, And the second part, which comes in the next half, in chapters 3 and 4, which I encourage you to go ahead and read, (laughs) uh, is about, uh, builds on this initial episode of grace that God shows to Jonah, and confronts Jonah with a question at the end. A question that probes uh, the idea of how far is too far, for us at least, when it comes to God showing undeserved mercy or grace to other people. When do we hit our limit of being able to expect or have the same kind of grace God shows to us shown to other people? So we'll get to that next week. But I want to just point it out generally at the beginning to recognize that this whole story is about God's grace, his mercy. Both parts are about how people receive something they don't deserve from God's hand. But even more specifically than this, It's about Jonah's reactions to that mercy that God shows. So in other words, the point of the story is not so much that God shows mercy to Jonah and Nineveh. The point revolves more around Jonah's feelings towards these gracious acts that God does. And Jonah has some very strong feelings. Uh, If you're familiar with the rest of the story, you'll get both of these. Uh, Feelings range... From the great thanksgiving that Jonah gives in chapter 2 where he prays this long prayer from inside the belly of the fish. Huge thanksgiving while he's still stuck inside the fish in chapter 2. So he has this great feelings of thanksgiving in response to the grace on one hand. But then when we get to chapter 4 in the end of the book, where he sees another episode of this kind of grace, Jonah tells God twice, quote, that it would be better for me to die than to live. So you see these huge emotional reactions from Jonah in response to the same kind of grace that comes from God. And this morning, as we consider the first half, we'll get to the second half next week, the first half of the story of Jonah, we're going to be asking this question, what is it about this grace of God that makes Jonah feel this first emotion, this thanksgiving? What makes him want to sing uh, in response to what God has done? And next week, with the second half of the story, we're going to ask... Uh, I think, you know, the, the most poignant question of the book is, what is it about God's same, the same kind of grace from God that makes Jonah feel like he wants to die, right? That's a surprising thing. It's the same grace, uh, but he has a very different feeling towards it. Um, but first, we're going to start uh, with the first half of the book. And before we uh, actually dive straight into um, talking about the message of the book, I want to take a few minutes just to talk about the fish. Uh, because people sometimes get hung up on the fact that Jonah gets swallowed by a giant fish, right? Because Jonah is a book of surprises. You'll see this all the way through. There's surprises about all things, and one of the biggest surprises is how God saves Jonah by sending a big fish to swallow him. And um, I'm not sure how aware of this you are or aren't, and this is why I'm talking about it, but there's a lot of debate between some people over the fish, Uh, And this debate over the fish can get quite heated at times. 
Uh, and I've spent quite a lot of time actually reading, uh, our scholars argue for one side or the other on the question of the historicity of this fish swallowing Jonah. And after having read of this, um, the answer I've kind of come to might be disappointing, but my, um, whatever you want to call a conclusion on this, is that we can't actually know with any certainty one way or the other. Uh, I would argue that both options are available. In other words, they're both live options. In other words, there's absolutely no reason to doubt that God has the power to use a big fish to save Jonah and the power to keep him alive inside of it for three days. A simple line of logic makes this crystal clear, right? Christ as Christians, we believe that God created everything out of nothing with a word. And we also believe that God rose Jesus Christ from the dead into a body that will never die again. And if God has done these two huge miracles, it is completely irrational for us to believe those things and then doubt that he can keep Jonah alive inside a fish for three days. Uh, that's just logic. And therefore, the historicity of Jonah, the Jonah story, is always a live option for us. For Christians, there is no issue with Jonah being literally swallowed by a big fish because there's no shortage of power in our God to make it happen. It is a miracle, and miracles are miraculous. And I think sometimes we forget this, right? That a miracle is something that cannot naturally happen. It's something that only God can do. If it could naturally happen, it wouldn't be a miracle. Therefore, we don't have a problem as Christians with the idea of God, the one who created all things and who raised Jesus from the dead, keeping someone alive in a fish for three days. <clears throat> the complicating factor is whether or not the story of Jonah was ever intended by God to make that claim. Jonah is a unique book, even within the Bible itself. It is the only prophetic book that is a narrative, that is a story instead of a collection of words or oracles and signs from God. God speaks, in fact, only five words in Hebrew of prophecy in the entire book, and they're all in verse 2. Uh, this book is dramatically different from every other prophetic book, including Amos, which we looked at previously. In fact, this book never even names Jonah as a prophet, which is one thing that's surprising. The, the main reason we know that Jonah is a prophet with certainty is because he is briefly named as a prophet in a book outside of Jonah. So in half of a verse from 2 Kings 14 verse 25, uh, we get all the historical information we have about Jonah. And that verse reads this. It says, uh, he, or Jeroboam II, is the king it's referring to, was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Labo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, that's the same guy, the prophet from Gath Hefer. So it calls him a prophet, and it tells us where he's from. If it were not for that half verse from 2 Kings, we wouldn't know even the most basic historical information about Jonah. We would not know when Jonah lived. We would not know where he lived. But because of 2 Kings, we do know something. We know that he lived uh, um, right around the time or just before Amos, which we were looking at before, and that he was from Gath Hefer, which is in Galilee. And so we might say shortly that, um, you know, he promised, prophesied around the time of Amos and lived pretty close to where Jesus grew up. That's what we know. But my point is that even this bare minimum historical information is not actually located in the book of Jonah itself. Jonah lacks even the most basic historical information that every other Old Testament book includes. In fact, even the Psalms give us more historical information than the book of Jonah. More than this, the book of Jonah depends on storytelling techniques that are not typically used in historical narratives. From the very beginning of the book, the story depends on surprising us with things like parody and satire in order to make its points. For example, in verse 2, it uses a prophetic formula common throughout the Old Testament where the Lord commands a prophet to up and go, and then like every other instance in the Bible, we expect the narrator to say that the prophet up and went. That's how it happens everywhere else. It's like God says, told the prophet up and go, and then we said, so the prophet up and went, and then did or said whatever the Lord asked them to do. But with Jonah, <laughs> We're shocked to find a parody of these words where uh, he's commanded to up and go by God, and then the next words that we find are that he's up and fled. 
Uh, this is supposed to shock and surprise the audience because they're used to hearing all these other formulas where the prophet always does what God tells him to do. And the book of Jonah is crammed with examples of Jonah doing this kind of thing, the exact opposite of what the rest of the Bible would lead us to expect a prophet to do. And the end of the book uh, leaves us with a question from the Lord instead of a message from him. In other words, unlike all the other books of prophecy in the Bible, which end with either a message of blessing or a message of warning, the book of Jonah leaves us hanging at the end with a question for Jonah from the Lord, which Jonah never answers. We never get the answer. It leaves us kind of on the edge. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that the way the story of Jonah has been told has much more in common with one of the parables of Jesus than it has in common with any other historical Old Testament narrative. For example, like Jesus leaves the older brother standing outside the house in the parable of the prodigal son, so in the same way Jonah is left standing outside Nineveh, we're wondering, is he going to go back in and be reconciled to those people who have now been saved by grace, or is he going to stay angry and leave? Like Jesus' parable of the workers hired at the 11th hour uh, issued this uh, anger from those who were hired at the beginning of the day and got paid the same amount as these people only worked one hour. So Jonah is left angry with God. Showing, uh, at showing that same grace he receives in the beginning of the story towards the wicked city of Nineveh. Like Jesus' parables, the book of Jonah is written in such a way not so much to reveal new facts. There's actually no things in the book of Jonah that you can't learn elsewhere in the Bible about who God is. It isn't so much about revealing new facts as it is about forcing us to address important questions. Questions we would otherwise avoid much like Jesus' parables do. And because the book of Jonah is so parable-like in the way that it's written, it has caused some people to ask if it may have been a parable from the very beginning. And that's the debate. Is the story just a parable, or is it a history that's told in a parable-like way? And I'm just saying, we aren't given enough information to know one way or the other. We simply don't know enough not even Jesus' comments on Jonah in the New Testament settle the matter for us because Jesus uses the Jonah story as an illustration. And illustrations cannot be used to verify history. If I, for example, used Lady Macbeth to try and explain an aspect of how we cannot have the blood washed off our hands by seeking means other than Christ, that does not mean I am claiming that Lady Macbeth was a real historical figure. And in the same way, when G Jesus talks about Jonah being in the belly for the fish for three days to illustrate that he is going to be in the grave for three days, it's not necessarily a claim to history. It's also not saying it's not history. <laughs> and this is my point. Uh, I'm just trying to get us to the point to understand that we can't know this and also to the point to know that does it actually matter for how we hear the word of the Lord. In other words, if I took the parable of the Good Samaritan that Jesus tells, which most people think is fictional, and we were told and we discovered that it happened to actually be based on a historically real Samaritan who did those things in real life, would it in any way change the message and meaning of Jesus' parable? And the answer to that question is no, it wouldn't. Not one little bit. The question of the historicity of the Good Samaritan does not change the meaning of the story. And it's the same with the book of Jonah. Whether it's history or fiction, the undeniable fact is that Jonah has been shaped into something like a parable and that the message remains the same whichever way we think it. And this is why I would say, along with G. G. Campbell Morgan, uh, warns us of the danger that people have been looking so hard at the great fish that they fail to see the great God. That the great danger, the greater danger, is that we can get so caught up in the debate about the history in this book, about whether Jonah was really swallowed by a whale or a fish, that we completely miss the message that God speaks through the book. Because that message is going to remain the same either way. Our conclusions about the fish come, I would argue, mostly from us and our presuppositions. Pre but the message of the book of the Jonah comes from God. And I don't want us to miss that. So I don't know how many of you needed to hear that, but my point is just to get us to the place where I want you to leave some of those questions to the side 
and listen to the message as the book presents it. And to get to that message, at least the message that's in the first half, it's helpful to start with asking a question. And that question is this. What is it about God's grace that made Jonah sing for thanksgiving to the Lord? That's the great turning point in the first two chapters. The chapters begin with Jonah rebelling against the word of the Lord, but it ends with Jonah praying a prayer of thanksgiving to this same Lord. And the most important thing here is to understand what caused this incredible change in Jonah. What was it that caused Jonah to make such a radical shift from running away from God to giving thanks to God? Well, in a word, it was grace. In other words, Jonah received undeserved favor from the Lord. And I want to quickly run through the story again to bring out the nature and importance of that divine grace for him and for us. And we start this by observing that Jonah is an example of what a prophet should not do. Okay, this is the point. Jonah is the prophet who does what he's not supposed to do. In other words, Jonah pushes rebellion against God to the limit. In other words, God commands him to go to Nineveh, but Jonah flees to the opposite direction, literally. Instead of going to Nineveh, which would have been uh, northeast, he goes southwest into the territory of the Philistines to the port at Joppa. There he gets on a ship crewed by non-Israelites heading for a place called Tarshish, And nobody knows exactly where Tarshish was, uh, but as Joanna Hoyt has commented and pointed out uh, from elsewhere, it's probably likely a word that's used in the same way we use the word Timbuktu, right? Timbuktu is a real place, it is. But when we use the word Timbuktu, we're usually just talking about, you know, something on the edge of civilized, you know, world, like, you know, to the ends of the earth kind of thing. And this is what Tarshish effectually does here in the story. It refers to the furthest place away from Nineveh that Jonah can go. So God tells him to go this way, and Jonah attempts to go as far as he can in the opposite direction. But the story gets, and it is a story, because the Lord decides he's not going to let Jonah go. This is where it gets interesting, right? In verse 4, we're told that the Lord sends a great wind to cause a storm that threatens to break up the ship and ruin Jonah's plans of running away. And at this point, Jonah's rebellion uh, begins to be seen not just in the direction he's going, but in a contrast between him and the sailors on the boat. So the rest of the first chapter one is going to contrast Jonah and these sailors. So the sailors, first of all, they cry out to their gods, right? They're pagans. They don't believe in the one true God, uh, but they cry out in prayer to the gods that they, you know, falsely worship, false gods they worship. Uh, And then they try to do something practical about their situation. They start throwing cargo overboard. But Jonah does the exact opposite. Jonah actually goes down into the cargo hold that they're trying to lighten and adds his weight to the part of the ship they want to lighten. Uh, And then instead of praying, he falls asleep. Uh, So Jonah, the prophet, refuses to pray while all these pagans are praying. And then in verse 6, The captain spots Jonah sleeping in the cargo hold, probably when he's coming down to take something out. And he wakes him up in verse 6, and he says this. He says, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. And yet still we're not told, there's no record of Jonah praying praying at this point. Uh, The pagan sailors are then convinced uh, by how bad this storm is that there must be something supernatural about it that, you know, they don't know who it is, but some god out there is upset with someone on board. And so they do what's called casting lots, which would be dice, things like dice, who maybe had their names on them, or some other way of determining, uh, trying to inquire from the gods whose fault it was. Uh, and, the di- and these lots uh, fall and indicate that it's Jonah. And so then they start questioning Jonah in verse 9, right? Uh, uh, they say, you know, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble and all these questions. And he answers saying, I am, res- I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And then in verse, the following verse, verse 10, it says, uh, this terrified them and they asked, what have you done? And it's important to recognize that this is a rhetorical question. They're not actually inquiring uh, more information about him. They already got that. That's what the note in the second half of the verse tells us. 
their question, what have you done, is an expression of moral outrage. In other words, if you saw someone push a button that launched a nuclear missile at Russia, and you said, what have you done? You would not be asking for technical spe specifications of you know, the, you know, what the button was doing. You would be looking at moral outrage at like, you have just launched something that's gonna kill so many people. Like, what have you done? This is what they're saying to Jonah. They're like, do you realize what you have done in upsetting the God who is in the heavens and has made the sea and the dry land? Uh, and yet, this is what uh, Jonah does. Uh, and so then the sailors are like, well, what are we supposed to do to you in response to this? And then Jonah says something that he should not say. What Jonah should say is turn the boat around so that I can actually obey the Lord and go to Nineveh like he commanded me to. That would be repentance, and that would be what Jonah should have said. But Jonah doesn't say that. Instead, Jonah tells them to throw him overboard. In other words, Jonah has come to the realization that he cannot escape from the Lord. He can't run away from him. But instead of repenting, instead of turning around, Jonah is saying that he would rather die than obey the Lord. Jonah would rather die than obey God's command to preach to Nineveh. And yet also note that no, Jonah doesn't volunteer to die. In other words, he doesn't voluntarily throw himself into the sea. There is no self-sacrificial love for the sailors here. Jonah is basically trying to make it even harder for God to get rid of him, I, I think. It's like he's saying to God, I would rather die than obey you, and if you're going to kill me, well, then you're going to have to turn these men into murderers to do it or drag them down with me. In other words, Jonah is a piece of work. He takes rebellion against God to its limit, even deliberately endangering the lives of others in his efforts to rebel against the Lord. And in stark contrast, the pagan sailors are righteous. They do their very best to save the ship without harming Jonah at all, despite all the damage they know he's done to them in upsetting the Lord. But when the storm gets even wilder, then they pray not to their own gods, they pray to Yahweh, to Jonah's God, asking him for forgiveness for throwing him into the sea. And so ironically, we find that Jonah the prophet still hasn't prayed, and now these pagan pray, the pagans are praying to the Lord on his behalf instead. Even after they throw Jonah into the sea and the storm comes to a sudden end, it's then these pagan sailors, not Jonah the prophet, who stand in great awe or fear of Jonah's God, and make sacrifices to him and promises to him. And they're doing this to Jonah's God, not to their own gods. So we're left with this picture of these pagans worshiping Yahweh while Yahweh's prophet Jonah is sinking to the bottom of the ocean, still refusing to pray. Or at least so it seems. The fact is that as vigorously as Jonah has rebelled against the Lord, when Jonah finally comes face to face with death, then at that last minute, Jonah finally prayed. We only find this out after the fact. We're told in chapter 1, verse 17, that now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And then at the beginning of chapter 2, in verse 1, it says, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. But when we read that prayer, we learn that it's actually the second time that Jonah has prayed, not the first time. In his prayer, in chapter 2, Jonah talks about the Lord hurling him into the deep and how he sank down to the roots of the mountain, so deep down into the waters, uh, and was engulfed by threatening waters. And then in chapter 2, verse 7, in the middle of his prayer, Jonah says this. He says, When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, past tense, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. In this prayer of thanksgiving to God from inside the fish, we learn that the fish that God sent didn't actually arrive right away. It wasn't until Jonah had sunk in the water and has felt his life ebbing away and then remembered the Lord and then prayed to the Lord for mercy that he was actually swallowed by the great fish. This is why Jonah pray, prays a prayer of thanksgiving even while he's still inside the fish. He doesn't have to wait till he's spit up on shore. <laughs> Because he knows that being alive inside a fish is much better than being dead at the bottom of the ocean. 
The point Jonah is making in his prayer in chapter 2 is that in spite of all of his rebellion against God, despite doing everything he could to do the opposite of what he knew God wanted, when Jonah cried out for mercy at the last minute, God heard his cry and saved him by means of a fish. This is why Jonah prays his prayer of thanksgiving inside that fish. Because he knows more than anyone else that he deserved to die. And even though it seemed like it was too late for him to be saved, even though his life was ebbing away at the bottom of the sea, that one cry to the Lord for help changed everything. That one cry changed everything for him. That one last cry for help was heard by the Lord, and immediately God was there to save Jonah in a miraculous way that Jonah could never have predicted. And my brothers and sisters, none of you have rebelled against God as dramatically as Jonah did. You may feel like you have screwed up. You may feel like after the things you've done, there is no way God would ever listen to you or want you. But Jonah is a much bigger screw-up than you are. Trust me. Some of the things you've done wrong were things where you really didn't understand what you were doing. But Jonah, as a prophet of God, knew exactly what he was doing. Jonah was not ignorant of his rebellion against God in any way, and he took that rebellion as far as it could go, right up to the moment of death. And yet one small cry for help at the moment before he died, would have died was enough. That small last-minute cry for help, and God was right there to save him in a way that only God can save. You see, God is so eager to save you and me, my brothers and sisters, to save us. He is so ready to give us his grace that it does not matter how rebellious you have been. and It does not matter how long you have waited. The moment you cry out to him, he is there for you to save you. Jonah didn't deserve it, and we don't deserve it either. That's just the way God is. It's his nature. He delights in saving us. And all we have to do is call on him for help. As both the prophet Joel and the apostle Paul were inspired by God to write, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. That is the joyful truth that Jonah discovers for himself personally in the first half of this book. After all of his rebellion and even after waiting to the last possible moment, he discovers this truth personally that everyone, and that means me, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that is a beautiful word, everyone, isn't it? Because it's a big word. Because there's room in it for you and there's room in it for me, isn't there? We all fit inside that. We all have the opportunity to cry out to God and be saved. And if anyone tells you that you've blown it, that God is done with you and it's too late, well, just remember the story of Jonah, God's rebellious prophet who was saved by God at the very last minute at that, with just that one little cry for help. And remember also, I would say, the, the joy that Jonah experiences, the great thanksgiving that he gave to the Lord even while he was still stuck inside that fish. That is the joy that belongs to each one of us when we finally stop running away from God and instead surrender our lives to his control and call on him as Savior. And my brothers and sisters, there is nothing like the experience of coming that po to that point of surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing like it in the world. That point when we finally let go and give our whole selves over to Jesus, trusting him alone as our Lord and our Savior, the beauty and joy of that moment of sweet surrender belongs to us, no matter what our outside circumstances may be. I mean, we know this because Jonah felt that joy while he was stuck inside a fish for three days. <laughs> and so the question that the first half of the book of Jonah leaves us with is this. Why are we trying to run away from God? My brothers and sisters, why are we trying to run away? He's told us to go to Nineveh. Why are we trying to go to Tarshish? He's told us to go east. Why are we trying to go west? He's told us to trust Jesus and be saved. Why are we looking to someone else or some other way for us to do it? Jonah experienced such incredible joy and gratitude only after he finally stopped running away from God. 
And what is it that's going, what is, what's it going to take for you and me to stop running away from God and instead give our lives fully and completely to Jesus? Why not just learn from Jonah's experience and do it now? That one little prayer to Jesus that says, save me, and means save all of me, that is an offering of all that I am to Jesus Christ, it works every time. That one little prayer, even offered after you think it's too late, changes everything. It did it for Jonah. I can witness that it's done it for me. And I know that through Jesus Christ, it does it for you too. Amen? Amen. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great story of grace, the grace that you showed to your rebellious prophet Jonah, who spent so much time trying to go in the other direction do, and trying to avoid doing what you wanted him to do. And yet, you, when he cried out that one time at the end, was met with your salvation, was brought up from the depths and into life again. And Lord, we recognize that you do this in a much greater way through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we recognize that we have rebelled against you and that we are prone to run away from you. But that even despite this rebellion, you love saving us. And so, Lord, we cry out to you again. Save us. Save me, O oh God. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. going to close by singing one final hymn. This is hymn number 11, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Hymn number, number 11. Would you please stand with me as we sing? As we close, I want to extend two invitations. Uh, the first is we would love to have you join us uh, for lunch. Uh, we have our chili potluck today and all the food's prepared. You don't have to have brought anything. Um, the second invitation um, is for you to consider, have you been running away from the Lord in some way? I mean, this is something Jonah was already uh, one of God's people and he ran away. And do you want to pray with someone? We have a prayer room just over on the, my left, your right. And if there is something that you feel you've been running away from the Lord over and you want to turn back to him, I encourage you to take the opportunity before you go to lunch to just spend some time with others praying about that. Um, and so now as you go, may you be reminded
that your love, your Lord and God, Jesus Christ, loves saving you. He never gets tired of that. And any cry you call out to him is a cry that he hears, and he comes, and he saves. Go now in peace, and serve your Lord. Amen.